Gracious God, we seek your spirit now and for this moment. Move through these words and reflections that we all may hear your voice, your message, your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Their presence in the story is actually larger in our minds than in the text. In the text, they appear almost as background to hear the angels, to move us from the fields back to the manger. But even in these few verses, in the little they do, the shepherds <coughs> loom large. From classic hymns like, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night, to newer and, and off the beaten path standards such as Little Drummer Boy. From their placement in our Christmas programs, who doesn't love the cute little children walking down, following cute even smaller little children in cheap costumes. From, well, way they hear them today. The shepherds are an important and unmissable part of the Christmas story and of our activity. And our story would be less rich without them. And so, as this journey through the nativity in preparation for Christmas nears its end, because Christmas is indeed next week, it is it good to look at the shepherds and ask what they might say to us about Jesus, about the story, about ourselves. To begin with, as I already told the kids on the front steps, any look at the shepherds must remember and acknowledge where they were placed in society, and that was really far down. The society looked upon those who had land as the ones who were highest up. Land was everything. It's how you farmed, it's how you ate. It was inheritance. Indeed, in ancient Israel, inheritance was a part of the whole part and parcel. While we don't know if they followed the rules or not, even those who lost their land on the Jubilee year were supposed to get it back, because that has connected you to your people. To own land was an important part of Jesus' society, and shepherds, by definition, didn't own land. In fact, many of them may not even own their sheep. They were hired hands, sitting in the fields at night while the owners were in their beds on their land, in their houses. So the shepherds were not thought of as well. Well, the kids, they probably stunk. I don't know how much sheep stink. I don't not have a lot of sheep in my life. But I presume uh, that because all wild animals have their own particular aromas, that sheep indeed also have their own particular aromas, and uh, probably they stink a little bit. The shepherds who care for them all the time, all day, but a stank. They were not the people you would think to hear the good news. These were not just blue-collar workers. They were those blue-collar workers that other blue-collar workers thought less of. The job was dirty and unclean. They were not the people you would invite to your nice Christmas party. And yet the angel comes and gives them an invitation. The heavenly chorus appears to make the destination known, and the shepherds are the ones who get to come to and even begin the party. And the applications, the implications seem clear to me. That the good news comes to the least of these. Indeed, the question might be not who the good news comes for, but is the story even including us? The shepherds are invited. The least of these are coming to the manger. Do we get to come too? I, mean, I think we do. But it's the blue collar, the workers, the least of these, who first get to hear the good news. The message of this gospel story is of a love that extends to all of God's people, including even especially those who the rest of society looks at 
as less than, at least, as something other. The good news of the gospel story and of the Christmas story of the shepherds is a gospel for all whom God loves, which is indeed all of us. The shepherds have a background role to play for most of the story, but that background role is powerful. It reminds us of God's love. But they don't just play a background role. For most of it, they do. But then they have their own actions, their own ability, their own agency. The angels come, and they preach this outrageously good, good news, this weird and wild and crazy story. But the shepherds could have stayed put. They could have said, that was weird. Don't make that boot again. They could have stayed in the fields where they belonged, where their jobs were. But they didn't. They took a risk to leave the fields. Whether or not their sheep came with them, we always picture the sheep along, but I don't know if that actually happens. They took a risk to leave their fields and go and see what the angels had proclaimed to them. To seek out the Christ child. To seek out that one born in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. They took a risk to believe the weird and wacky and wild vision they had experienced as something worth pursuing, as something true and meaningful. And after they find it, after they indeed find Jesus, find Mary and Joseph, find the manger and the babe, they go and tell. They go and praise God and tell others what they have seen and heard and experienced. They go and tell others that they have seen something of God, something holy, something beyond imagining. Now, they didn't understand it all at that point. No one did. Not the shepherds, not Mary, not Joseph. And Luke, not even Jesus, he has a baby. The rest of God's plan, the rest of what was to occur the next 30 plus years, well, well that hasn't happened yet. The shepherds knew something had happened. Something worth telling, worth sharing, worth proclaiming. And so they did. And in so doing those things, they provide us not just an example of how wide God's love expands, but also an example that we are to do. Because we know the rest of the story. We know about the Jesus born in the manger who grows up into a man and teaches good news, teaches about God's love, and teaches about how to live in ways that reflect the scriptures already given, that reflect the ways of God already being proclaimed, that looks at the Jewish scriptures that were his scriptures and says, hey, look, they actually say this, now go do that. We know of the one who grew up and faced the cross, who died to show us that God's love cannot be silenced, that God's love expands all boundaries, and that God's mercy and grace and forgiveness goes beyond our imagining. We know of the one who grew up and died and was resurrected so that we might know that death itself is not the end. So that we might know that new life awaits for us. New life that begins right now but extends through all eternity. A new life with God that we can't even begin to comprehend. We know of the one who grew up and who is somehow still with us, who is present, who is Emmanuel, God with us, not just 2,000 years ago, but right now. We know the rest of the story. 
We've seen God and experienced God and felt God through Jesus in our own lives, in this space, in the world. And so we too are invited to come and see, to hear again the story, to hear again and remember what we know and have heard and have seen and experienced. And they go and tell. They tell others about God's love, tell others about the Christ child, tell others about Emmanuel, God with us, to tell others about the ways, the many ways, the ways beyond imagining that God is present in the world, in our lives, in the lives of those around us. Shepherds give us an example of what we can do to come and see and go and tell. <coughs> Friends, the Nativity is a reminder to us of the story that we center around this season. A reminder to us of God's love and grace seen in Jesus Christ. It's a reminder to us that we too and like the shepherds, come and see, come and experience, come and be renewed on Saturday night at 9 p.m. But it's also a reminder to us <coughs> to go and tell, to take not these degrees, what they, what, they, what they represent, to bring them with us, to share that good news with all the world. So on this fourth Sunday of Advent, that we prepare for Christmas, come and see, and then go and tell. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's Shepherd Sunday.